Remember to do something like this. Every single time the file comes your way, you're given a file to read by your senior, to maybe read or to argue the matter yourself. First and foremost, so okay, one thing is that you at the end goal is always to try and summarize, make concise the entire file, the entire brief, including your case, the opponent's case, in maximum 20 to 40 seconds before the judge. And if you cannot do that, you have to go back to the drawing board, get back and slash away at information to make it as simple as possible. The best counsels in the apex court as well are paid a lot of money only because of their advocacy skills. And what are advocacy skills? But to convince a person to decide in one's favor. And you only get to do that when you are making things concise. Apart from that, when you open up a file, I explain to every junior, because this is what I was told as well. Whenever you open the file, you first and foremost look at the prayer clause. You look at what relief has been sought by the litigant, be it your client or be it the opposing party. After that, you look at the facts of the case, what has been said. And after that, you look at the orders that have been passed. If it's not a fresh matter, what are the orders which have been passed by the previous court? So I recently sent uh, these associates to do a matter on my behalf while I was busy elsewhere. And they stood in front of the judge and made their submissions. And when the judge said something, they were not able to give a fitting reply. And they were not even able to object to what the judge was suggesting as a course of action. Simply because they did not, and of course I forgot, I forgot to tell them, read the prior order sheets first. So they did not read the order sheets and that led them to you know, agree with whatever the judge is saying willy-nilly. So one thing that you have to remember is read the prayer clause first, read the facts of the case and then read the prior order sheets and then proceed accordingly. Couple of things that you should always be mindful of, I am not going to tell you, but you should not, at the day that you make your first submission, remember, oh my God, I don't even know which side to stand on. There's the district courts, there's the high courts, there's the Supreme Court and tribunals. Every place has a different set of business, different set of rules as to how uh, lawyers stand and appear before the judge. I would also want to go into the difference in the nuances of addressing arguments before the trial courts, before the high court and before the Supreme Court. And one great example that comes to my mind is that when I started my practice, I first went to district courts and I realized as a junior counsel who had the liberty to make his own submissions the entire time in courts, I realized that district courts are more of a wrestling mat where you have to grapple with the other side, you have to butt in with your submissions, you cannot take it nice and easy because if you do, the opponent is going to chew you up and spit you out. The judge is not going to give you any opportunity either, unless he's a very good judge, there are very few of them. What you need to do is to force your way with your submissions and as a strategy I say go ahead and keep interrupting your oppon op opposing counsel as well. That is something that people don't talk about. I love to do it and I think it's a very valid strategy of course. Do not overdo it, it's a nuanced point. You have to kind of feel the things out and, and proceed accordingly. I tried that same district court pushover method in the Supreme Court and I remember, I forget the name of the judge. And he, the first time that I ever made my submissions before, before the Honorable Supreme Court, that judge who went on to become the Chief Justice of India on one occasion, told me to take my seat and to literally to shut up. So that's another thing that you'll have to remember. When you go to court, you have to observe what the other councils are doing, how these matters are proceeding with them. And just a couple of days ago, I was asked uh, by someone else as to how, uh, you know, what are the other things you can do to bolster your criminal practice. One thing that I suggested was that I used to do for a long time was that whenever I would have a matter before one particular judge and I would not have so many matters that I would know, okay, this XYZ judge of this particular court has this certain way of functioning or this particular judge of the XYZ court has this particular way of functioning. When I would not know about it, 
I used to go online and if anybody, any among you has actually interned uh, in the high court around that time, you would be amazed to find out. Say for example, if you have a matter which is effectively perhaps item number 20 or 30 on the board, so you think that you are relatively safe till around 11.30 or 12 p.m. to go before the judge, especially if you've addressed arguments in front of any other judges, you will realize that Justice Garg would sit precisely at 10.30 a.m. and wrap up all the matters by precisely 10.45 a.m. Within 15 minutes, he would be done with the entire board. So if you do not know this particular quirk about Justice Garg, you would be in for a treat because you will end up in court, you will see the entire courtroom empty except for his court staff and you will assume for a second that the judge is on leave. But then you will be t told by these court staff that the judge has actually disposed of all the matters and has now kept uh, some matters for final hearing at perhaps 12 p.m. And it was not that he was a lazy judge or something. He was a judge who used to be so well prepared with the files inside out that it does not even matter what kind of a counsel appears in that matter. He had already made up his mind for each and every single file based on what submissions were there in the file. So he would just show up, dictate his orders in every single matter and then move on to proceed for the bigger um, matters which needed a lot more of his attention. Okay, I have been asked to wrap up a little uh, quickly, uh, quickly. I'll give you very, very few like basic points in like perhaps a minute about uh, some things that you should also consider. Approaching lawyers for jobs and for internships. I personally feel that emails are dead. Even the CV to a good extent is dead, except to the extent that you need to show it as something that, yes, you, you're, you're diligent, you are hardworking, you have enough sense to actually make a CV. But as to what an employer, a prospective employer looks at is almost completely irrelevant. What matters instead is what kind of a story you have. If you can convey that with your CV, great. But if you cannot at the same time also convey that story in the cover letter itself, it is a futile effort. Use LinkedIn as a tool. It is extremely powerful. I have reached out to some incredible people on LinkedIn. I have had incredible people reach out to me. I have had, I have given jobs when people have approached me on LinkedIn. I have encouraged other people to do so. They have found a lot of success. And let me tell you, I have also found clients on LinkedIn. Get on there as quickly as possible and start posting, start talking, start asking questions as much as you can. Power of collaboration with other lawyers. A lot of you lawyers, law students come to me and say that we are not sure about how to proceed with you know, internships and, and jobs and we are kind of lost. The first thing that I would like to tell all of you is forget about that salary. I myself remember there was this one occasion where I did not know much about Supreme Court work. But I had matters of my own to such an extent that I could not join somebody full time. So I went to a college senior of mine who was also an advocate on record and I told him, sir, I do not want any money. I just want to learn AOR work. We have an AOR among us. So, you know, we can, you can perhaps hit him up for, for that kind of work. I went, in, I went up to him and I told him that I don't want any money. I just want to learn. I'll be happy to do my drafting for him. And in return, all I seek is that he guide me as to exactly how my drafts are wrong and what is the practice and procedure of the Supreme Court that I should be learning. And the moment I, I mean, you know, I, I spent around two, three months over there around two years ago. And just by doing that, whenever anybody would approach me to uh, do any work, earlier I was not able to close Supreme Court matters. After that, after that experience, after spending two, three months over there with another person who already had a lot of matters and after helping him out, I was able to get clients of my own and I was able to do decent work for the Supreme, in the Supreme Court as well. Now, apart from that, what kind, of a, what kind of a quality should you focus on? Honing as well as highlighting when you are working for somebody else is also extremely important. You thinking that you are good at research maybe is not enough. In today's day and age, you must be good at drafting. And how do you good, get good at drafting? You do not get good at drafting by reading someone else's drafts or by reading someone else's files. You get good at drafting by hounding your senior to give you drafting work, by making mistakes as quickly as you can in those drafts, going up to your senior and asking that senior to correct those drafts. 
but more importantly spending time taking out that time and spending that time with if you can do that if you can forget about the fact that you're in law school right now that you know you're supposed to kind of take it a little easy because i know i did that for a long time if you can forget about that and treat yourself as a lawyer as a full time practicing lawyer with a certain amount of paycheck that you imagine for yourself if you can do that and even though you have to work for free for maybe a few weeks a few months or maybe a year or two the moment you step into the actual playing field you will do far better than any of your other contemporaries there are a bunch of other things i would have loved to talk about unfortunately we 